Hello again, YouTube. Welcome back to another Adventures in Coding video. Today, we're picking up where we left off with part two of making our particle system. Before we jump into it, I just wanted to say a couple things at the top. First off, thank you to everyone who watched the first one. Uh, it's awesome how many views I'm getting now. It's great. The subscribers, all of the comments, all of the thumbs up. I really appreciate all of it. So I just wanted to start off by saying that. Uh, hopefully, we can make something really cool with this particle system that we can package up and you guys can use for your games or your projects. So that's my hope with all this. I also wanted to say I'm just about finished the next update for ReadyMart. It's a minor update that's going to improve the mouse and keyboard handling as well as the controller input handling in the game. And once that's out, I'm going to be on to chapter three of the game, which is super exciting. So all of that kind of update aside, let's start talking about our particle system. So if you guys remember from our last video, we basically created a setup to render individual particles. I have it going here, but we made a particle class, which held on to some of the information for an individual particle. And we also set up this helper class that we used. And then we went through and we filled out a vector of those particles and we go through and we render them. Something I should call attention to right off at the start. I think I talked about this in the last video, but you guys will remember uh, Visual Studio crashed every time I went to make a particle class. That was because I already had my existing particle class that I had made, excuse me, sorry, to uh, practice for this, to get all my code in order. So I've gone through and I've removed those and we're good to go now, but I've removed class from all of the names of the files. And it's the same thing on GitHub. So just so there's no confusion, um, if you followed along and you wrote code and you made it the particle class, helper class, that's no problem. You can just leave it like that. And when we make new classes, you can add it as well class if you'd like. I think that's about it for the preamble. Let's talk a little bit about what we want to get done today. So we're trying to kind of have this iterative approach with this series of getting closer and closer to having a nice particle system. So our first step was rendering individual particles. Today, we're gonna add a new class and we're gonna make a particle system class. And we're gonna do that for a couple reasons. Um, some will kind of show through today and others it's gonna be over time, it's gonna set us up. So in terms of today, uh, we're gonna make the particle class to start trying to pull all of the particle code out of main. We're not gonna do it all today. Um, really, like we're not gonna bring the shader over there uh, the vertices, all of that. But really, eventually, the goal here should be we have a particle system class, which you can include in your project, and that can slot into your OpenGL rendering pipeline without any kind of issues. Like, you shouldn't have to load your shader outside of the system, right? So that's a big benefit of our particle system we're going to make is encapsulation. But the other kind of more domain-specific benefits are around particles. So right now, we go through and we make these particles by calling the constructor, right? And we're calling each individual one. The particle system is going to kind of enhance our logic. So it's going to be a little bit today, but over time, it's going to start to manage the particles. If you guys know anything about particles, there's a lifespan on an individual particle usually. So oftentimes in game engines or in 3D renderers, particles will only last for a certain amount of time and then they're dead and you can spawn new ones. So that type of management, we're gonna hide and put behind our particle class. And as well, stuff like, instead of doing all of these as individual render calls, as I go down here, why don't we instance this? Instead of having all of these particles as individual calls, why don't we make a big array of particles and do all of our instancing, right? So there's quite a few reasons. And even as well, I should mention particle emitters. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last time, but the idea is particle emitters for the most part are gonna be what creates particles. Or sometimes you'll wanna have one-time particle emits, like a bullet hits a wall and just spawn out some particles. So instead of being able to raw create particles with their constructors, we're gonna have our particle system kind of wrap a lot of that away and kind of have the functionality a little bit better that way. All right, so with all that talking, all that yapping done, 
let's write some code. We're gonna start out with the not as exciting thing, and then we'll get to some more exciting things. So we're gonna do this in kind of three parts. We're going to update our update functions, our methods, uh, to take in delta time. We're not even gonna make use of it today, but just it's a good thing to have. We'll talk more about that as we go. We're gonna add in our particle class and we're gonna switch all of our code over to use that. And then if we have time, we're gonna also add in some textures, which is gonna be some interesting problems. Okay, so let's start with the update function. So if you've done any code around game engine programming or 3D renderers, uh, even if you've used like Unity or uh, di uh, not DirectX, if you've used uh, Unreal, uh, it's super common to have this paradigm of having an update method. And usually update has a delta time in it. So without getting too much in the weeds here, the idea is delta time is the amount of time that has passed since the last update. And if you use that when you have movement on screen, then your game's movement won't depend on the frame rate. There's a lot there. If you haven't heard of any of this before, you're probably hearing that and you're like, what did he just say? What does that mean? There's a lot you can learn about related to that. But for today, we're just gonna make sure that we have a delta time parameter coming into these functions, these methods, I should say. So we're gonna have a const float. I like to call it DT for delta time. You can also write it out. Um, in this case, I'm not gonna pass this by reference, right? Cause it's just a float. It's not gonna save any copy time in terms of passing a memory address versus the actual float, uh, even though we have it by const. Okay, so we're gonna have that there. And inside our particle, we're also gonna do the same. All right, so to make this work now, we have to actually keep track of delta time. So the code we're gonna use is gonna be from glfw get time. Okay. Now you might be wondering, these are doubles and you made those function parameters floats, right? Um, this is really, at this point in time with modern computers, it's kind of almost a, a point of opinion at this point. Um, for a long time, people would use floats just because they felt like we didn't have as much accuracy or the accuracy to use doubles. Uh, at this point, it really doesn't matter. You could use doubles and have more precision and there would be no real drawback. I'm just using floats because I usually use floats for like positions and things like that. Uh, but yeah, more of a holdover than anything. So I'm going to use these doubles because that's what we get out of uh, glfw get time and I'm going to cast it to a float. So uh, important to note this get time, it's almost like looking at your watch. It is going to give you the exact time that it currently is. So in terms of figuring out delta time, we're going to say prev time is equal to current time and current time is equal to glfw get time. Okay. And then when we go to call update, we'll pass it current time minus previous time. And what we're doing here, it's almost like uh, if you, I don't know, are running track and you don't have a stopwatch to check and see how long your laps are taking, it's like as you cross the line, you look and see, okay, it's 12.05, and then you run a lap and it's 12.06, well, you know one minute has passed, right? <laughs> Some easy numbers with that, but. So that's it for our updates. Like I said, we're not really making use of it right now, but I just wanted to get that in, make sure we get that added because we're gonna want it later on. We'll make sure everything's running okay still. Looks good. And now we're ready to take on some bigger challenges. So we are gonna start with our particle system being added. So I believe I got rid of the existing classes, so I should have no problem calling this particle system. You could really call this whatever you want. You could call it particle manager, you could call it anything at all. The world is your oyster. 
And I should add all of these files under source file. Okay. And really, if, if I was a good person, I would add a header filter, but I like having them all together. I was a good person. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of change to the code, but really fundamentally, what we're trying to do here is we want to take code like this, like our vector of particles, like our render calls, and we wanna take that and put it behind this class. So we'll start out with some includes. Like I said, we're gonna make use of that vector. So we're gonna need our vector class. I'm just gonna move my microphone a little. Of course, we're also going to need the particle class because it's going to hold vector or particles. Now the next one I'm gonna add um, might not be immediately obvious. I'm adding glad here. Uh, the reason why I'm doing that is we're gonna move our render code into this class. Glad will give you items like draw elements, uniform matrix, all of that good stuff. Um, and I think I say this in all my videos, but I like to have all of my library includes separate from including my own files or my own classes. Okay, so we'll give it a default constructor. Not actually gonna do anything in there. And then we're gonna give it an update function as well. And we'll give it a render function. Um, like I said, eventually we should really move the shader into here, but for the time being, we'll pass it in. I wonder if we could make that a const. Let's try that and see what happens. Maybe OpenGL doesn't like that, but. And I'm also going to make a function to create particles. <clears throat> so like I said, really ultimately, we shouldn't be using functions like this that often. Uh, we should have emitters that we use more than anything, but for the time being, we're kind of trying to take an iterative approach, one change at a time. So we're gonna add this functionality in so we can still use our same code we use to create all of our particles. And for color. Sorry again about the U. It's where we're at. Oh, I should also make this public before I forget. Okay, so to go along with this, we are going to have a vector of particles like we've had. Now the two next things we're gonna do is an addition, it is a change. And that's because we're gonna switch to instantiating or instancing rather, and not instantiating, two uh, complicated programming I words I'm switching up. Uh, we're gonna use instancing here so that instead of looping through calling over and over again, draw, 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 we're gonna try to do all of our draw calls at once. And so to do that, we need to pass an array of all of the items we're gonna need. So we'll have our vector of colors and our vector of matrices. Okay. I don't think I'm gonna ever, I don't think these really need to be accessible. I'm trying to keep good coding practices for these examples. And so making these private is probably a good idea. We'll add all these in. Okay. So some of these are actually pretty easy. We can just copy and paste what we had. So for instance, in our main here, the update is going to be the same thing, right? It's going to be M particles instead. We're gonna update. Um, we're gonna get back to this because we are gonna have to make a change, but for now I'm gonna leave it the way it is. Okay. So when we call create particle, it's really wrapping all of the same behavior. So I'm gonna say particles dot in place back. If you remember from our last video, in place back means we don't have to call the constructor here. So I'm gonna pass these parameters in loose and in place back is gonna make sure that the constructor is actually called. 
color. Okay. And with our matrices, every time we add a particle, we're going to emplace back a new matrix, or matrix, I should say. Now, I'm going to write this out full because this can be a little bit confusing otherwise. So we're going to push back an identity matrix, which just means it's really, it's like multiplying by one. But you'll see my vAssist says, hey, you don't need to call the constructor here. It'll do it by itself. So I show that just to add some clarity, right? Because if you say, why am I adding a float of one to our matrices? It's not exactly clear. This should be colors. An S dot in place back and we'll give it our color. Okay. So our create particle is looking good. With our update though, we're gonna wanna change something. So before we were just calling update, right? And inside update, we were looking to see if there was a transformation change. Actually, you know what, at this code, we checked to see if transformation change is true, but we never set it to false. So we better add that in. And so if we do update our matrix, we're gonna to wanna to change it in here, right? Because that's where we're storing it. Um, it's kind of up to you. No matter what, we're gonna to have to switch to an old school for loop. So we'll say particles.size. And then this is going to be particles at i update. And then matrices at i. This is why we need that is equal to particles at i dot get m. So if we do it this way, every single update, we're going to store the new value. We'll update the value. It's not super expensive doing that. It's really not that big of a deal. But we did set up all of this code, so only on changes uh, are we updating our matrices because this is more expensive. But So if we wanted to keep going with this, I haven't tried this in my example, I'm just kind of looking at it now. We could switch this to a bool and we could say, if, a trans if we have updated, we return true. Otherwise, return false. And then back when we go to use it, we say if I think I've talked about this in other videos before, but uh, you can write out equal equal true, or you could just leave it as it is because it's going to return true. Right. So let's give that a shot. I haven't done that in my example. Uh, hopefully, it doesn't break anything, but. We're going to find out now our render. So this is going to be partially what we had before in main and partially updated because now we're going to be using uh, instancing. So we're going to set our view and projection matrices outside of this because we don't want to set it every single time. We could really, it's not actually a bad idea. We could pass those in. Maybe we should do that. Because that makes sense. Have a const mat four. Once again, not in my example. I'm just looking at it, and it makes sense to me that if we're going to try and have all of our particle code in here and have it separated away from main, why don't we update the cons in here? Okay. So back in main, we're going to grab all of that then. And we can paste. <clears throat> okay. So we're gonna have to make some changes. So that's P. That's P. That's good. Instead of our shader.id, this is now going to be shader ID. We're not going to be doing any looping anymore, right? Because we're going to try and do this all in one draw call. We don't need to get the color anymore because we have an array of colors. And now we kind of have to do some updating in here. 
So before we were just setting one color and one matrix, now we need to set a variable number, right? So our color is going to add a V for variable. We're still using shader ID there. Okay, so we're getting it is good. It's gonna change a little bit the syntax. So the number of items we're gonna set is colors.size. And we are just going to set um, colors. Okay. Now for our matrices, similar approach, a little different because we have to include that GL false, but size. And we're going to do matrices and an extra. Okay, now one last step, our draw elements is now going to be draw elements instanced. And just at the end, we need to tell it how many particles we're drawing. So we'll just do matrices.size. Okay, nice, we're moving here. I guess I should wait and see if, uh, <laughs> if it all compiles and runs okay before I say nice. So that looks nice, that looks good. We've got that change implemented. Now back in our main, we're gonna to have to update some code. So first off, we're no longer gonna include particle. And this is kind of by design. We really don't want main or other classes using particle system, or particle rather. We want them to use particle system. So instead of having a vector of particles, we're now going to have a particle system. We can call this anything your heart desires. I don't really have a good answer. Calling it particles seems, I don't know, not the best. Calling it particle system is definitely not good. Calling it PS is definitely really not that great either, but maybe we'll go with PS. Okay, so when we initialize our particles, instead of calling in place back, all of our code is gonna be the same, but we're gonna say create particle, right? And create particle really does the same thing. The only thing that's changed is it also is storing matrices and colors. That looks good. In our update, instead of iterating over, we're now gonna say ps.update, give it delta time. And in our render, after we set the shader, we're gonna say ps.render. We need to give it, what do we call it? My shader. No, let's go. Our shader. It's not mine, it's ours. And we give it the view and we give it the projection. As this is actually our shader.id. Okay. So I like this change of passing in the view and the projection because in this theoretical situation where you're slotting this into your rendering pipeline that already exists, you most likely already have a camera defined and then you just need to pass these matrices in. So I like that change. Let's see if this works though. Let's see if we have any issues. We should really get the same output on screen. Hmm. Oh. I'm sure you guys are laughing at me for this one. I forgot to even touch her shaders. <laughs> That's foolish of me. I was getting too excited. I feel like there's always one too many steps with OpenGL and I always skip the last one. So because we now are instancing, we need to update our shaders, right? So for instance, M here is no longer just one matrix, it's now going to be an array of matrices and same thing with our colors here. So we talked about this with the text rendering video. I'm gonna set this to 100 right now. This is good, it's a step up from what we had, but having this hard limit is not ideal, um, especially when everyone has different graphics cards, right? So who knows? Uh, how large that number can actually be to work on everyone's computer and you want to maximize individual computers. This is not ideal right now. 
Ideally, we want to switch to a uniform buffer object, and we will eventually, but for the time being, it's a good step forward. So I'm going to access that matrix or that array at GL instance ID. So this instance ID is just the what matrix or what particle are we rendering now? So it'll go through if we're rendering the fifth particle, give me index five, right? It'll let us access that. Now, because we want to have that over in our fragment shader where we're going to be doing the same thing, we're going to add a variable that we pass from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. I have it set to flat because it's going to remain the exact same, no interpolation uh, across our quad. And we just say it's equal to GL instance ID. Okay, so it's out here, it's leaving the vertex shader and it's going to be in here. Oops, I forgot it. So instead of color, It'll be color at index. Okay, that's looking good. I just wanna make sure that path is right. Yeah. Let's see what we can get up to. So it's the right path. Still nothing. If we don't have any errors, hmm. So let's set a breakpoint and let's take a look. I truly don't know what's going on here. This isn't a, uh, a phony pretend like I know why we're breaking. Let's take a look and see. Okay, so we're gonna go into render here. Okay, so we have 30 colors, we have 30 matrices, that's great. View has some values, that's good. So there's the projection. So that's promising. What are we missing though? I wonder with the update, I wanna make sure when we create our particles, We do set it to true. Let's try setting one in here. Okay, so we return true. So we get that matrix. This is the first particle. You can see that one's getting set. That's great. Okay, so that seems to be working just because I hadn't tried that code. On my end, I wanted to make sure that was good. Let's take a look here. Okay, so we do matrix size. We're still doing M, we're still doing color, which is good. Okay, let's check out. These guys look good. Go back to main. So we call render, we say use our shader, call particle system render. clear every time. I do want to make sure these are the right files because I do have a bunch of shaders on the go. Documents, particle system, texture. That looks good. I'm also not getting any, um, the console will tell us if we have an error. I'm not seeing anything. 
like to test that if I were to do space there. Yeah. So our shader is compiling no problem. What have we done? What are we doing wrong here? We initialize. Oh, do we set the BAO? I think so. Let's just give that a shot. I don't think that'll fix it. Let's also, this is always a good idea. Probably not going to fix anything or give us any output, but certainly nothing. Okay, setting those looks good. Oh my gosh, foolish, swap those two. Let's see if that fixes it. There we go, that's so dumb. <laughs> I apologize, I swapped those two matrices. That would definitely make it sense that it doesn't work. Okay, so, whew, figured that out. So we have our particles back on screen, obviously not a huge change yet, uh, but this is good. This is a good step forward. Uh, there is a couple of things I want to talk about before we take a stab at textures next. So the thing I want to look at right now is some hardware states, which is what I like to call them just because I have, I spent some time with DirectX, which is what you would call them there. So we say blending is okay, right? We enable blending. Without this, We get solid colors and we get no blending, right? So we want to have blending. That makes sense because we're multiplying by uh, actual uh, alpha values. As well, we might want to use some depth hardware states. So we're saying depth mask is true. So we are going to write to our depth buffer. We are enabling depth test and we're saying less than or equal to. Okay, sorry, I did a copy and paste there from my other solution, but this is saying every time you draw a new particle, make sure to store its depth. This is saying enable depth testing, and this is saying throw out particles that are less than the current depth. Okay, so we're getting this blank screen, right? Why is that the case? Because this makes sense to do depth testing, right? You'd think that this there's nothing wrong with that. The reason why we're getting that blank screen is we also need to make sure that we clear the depth buffer, especially just by default, the depth buffer might be a value that wipes everything out on the test. So now you can see we're drawing again, but you can see where individual particles run into each other. Now, this is a whole topic in computer graphics, right, about transparencies. We might not actually want this, and to get good transparencies, you need to sort your draw calls, which we're really not doing, but it is something that's not a bad idea to enable in the general case. And the third state I wanted to look at here is culling. So do we want to have culling enabled? Typically, culling is a good thing. It can cut down on unnecessary uh, draw calls, right? Or unnecessary uh, render calls. But 
you notice when I run this, we lose some quads, right? So why is that? Ugh. I'm going back and forth too much between VS Code and Visual Studio KC. There we go. So if I remove it again, they're back. Now the reason for that is when we cull, we use the right hand rule. So we go around our triangle and we look to see which way is the face of the triangle pointed, where is its normal, to determine is this particle facing the camera or is it facing away from the camera. Obviously, we just want to draw particles on screen, right? So we don't actually really want to cull any faces because if a particle is facing the opposite direction, let's just show it anyway. We're going for like bulk over specifics, right? So we might actually just want to say, oops, disable call face. Now, why would you want to do that, right? The reason is, if we're going to build this rendering pipeline and we're going to have it slot into, or if we're going to build this particle system and we're going to slot it into someone else's project, they might be doing backface culling, right? That's a super normal optimization to do in your rendering pipeline. So it's good to set the hardware states we want, even if they're already set right now, just to be super explicit. So when this project joins someone else's project, we don't have any issues. And of course, all of this should really be brought into uh, our render call, which I can do here. I run that. Beautiful. Okay. So that was kind of the hardware states discussion I wanted to talk about. Now we are going to attempt to get some textures working, which I feel like if I had aced the first pass of all of this, I would feel more confident. But having made that dumb matrix mistake, now I'm feeling a little worrisome because the textures always involves a little bit more uh, margin for error. But let's go for it. Let's make this particle class extra fancy. And, you know, as I'm joking around here, but obviously we want to be able to use textures. That's very standard. Your particle shader should be able to use textures. So we're going to have to adapt our particle system to hold the, the textures and make use of them. And we're also going to have to add some functionality to be able to load textures and bind textures. So in our helper class, I'm going to start here. Uh, and this is kind of the pain in the butt to write. So I'm going to make a function load texture, which will take in a string path. Okay, so we're going to make use of this and because we want to be able to call load textures really easily, uh, we're going to add it. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is, is running out of energy. So we'll include string to get rid of that error. That looks good. Okay, and the other thing we want to have in here is a function, a static function, bind textures. This would probably much rather belong in the um, shader class that we have with Learn OpenGL, but as it is, I'm going to include it here just because it's not really my place to modify their shader class, mostly because someone else is going to get this project and they're going to say, hey, I added all of your code and I didn't think to touch the shader. Why is this not working? Right? So I'm going to do it specifically in here. We need the vector class. So this bind textures class is just going to let us bind all of the textures in our vector here to our shader so we can make use of them. Okay. Now to make this work, actually, before I leave, we're going to need Speaking of learn OpenGL code, we're going to need STB image 
to do our loading. And I think we're going to need glad. Yeah, we will because we're going to use it for uh, bind textures. Okay. So now comes the tricky part. So this load texture code that I'm going to use, it is literally what was in this example before. I think if I go into like one of these, it is this code, the exact same. Okay, I'm tempted to just copy and paste it, but I'll, I'll be studious, I'll be diligent, and I'll type it. So we're gonna make a unsigned int to hold the texture handle. We'll gen our textures, we're gonna do one. And the texture, we will bind texture. D texture. We're going to set those parameters. So PL texture to D. We're going to say GL texture wrap S. Well, you can do however you want to do the texture wrapping. Um, I don't think in this example we're even gonna go beyond those UV coordinates, so it's not really gonna matter. Same thing with the filtering, uh, but I'm just setting it just to, good to be explicit about it, right? Okay. It's going to be linear for the time being. If you wanna set something fancier, you can definitely do that. Okay, let's get to loading. So this is how they wrote it. I really don't like doing, uh, making variables like that. I like to break it up into multiple lines. And really I would probably like it better if I set those all to some values so we don't end up in a bad spot, but Set flip horizontally on load. So as you guys may know, super common with OpenGL that you want to flip a, a texture vertically when you load it. Now let's do our load unsigned char data is equal to stbi load. Now, this is actually where there is going to be a change I'll call attention to. So when I went in here, okay, so here I wanna point out, uh, you'll notice I'm just using the path here where if I go to one of the previous examples, we use this nice file system, get path, which is super handy. Uh, I wanted to use it, uh, but because this the way this class is set up, uh, it was declaring some variables. And then when I went to add it into helper and then included helper in multiple locations, uh, I was getting collisions on the name. So I'm gonna avoid it. I'm gonna give the absolute path here, uh, just kind of unfortunate, but I just wanted to explain why I'm doing that. Okay, nice. So we'll say if data, else image free and we'll return minus one really don't actually even need that else do we why don't we just because if we're successful in here we're going to return in here so text image 2d I'm almost there Freedom is in sight. Zero. G L R G A width height. Zero.
Now you might look at that and you might say, don't wait a minute, aren't we holding on to the number of channels? Yeah, we just don't want to deal with all of the permutations and writing a bunch of ifs, right? I think the thing with code like this is if you are so inclined and you'd like to build out uh, some libraries or you'd like to make your own engine, these are the things that are kind of easy pickings, right? That you should really build for yourself. Most people who are writing big OpenGL projects have things like this that they've written. Okay, we'll return texture. Let me do a once over because that was a lot of typing. All right, so this function, if it successfully loads, will return the handle to that texture. Almost done, just got one more in here. So for our bind textures, we're gonna iterate over input. We're gonna say active texture, we're going to do GL texture, capitalizing zero plus I. So in my engine, I actually don't even really use raw textures a lot. I use a lot of bindless textures, but in a lot of coding examples, you'll see every time you want to use a texture slot, you have to say active texture, texture zero, texture one, texture two. Doing this is just going to loop through setting all of them to active for however many we mean or we need. Um, obviously, there is an opportunity here to use more textures than you have slots for, so you have to be careful, but we're gonna play it safe right now. I. Okay, so we bind it and we set that uniform. Beautiful. All right, so that was part of the trickiness. Now, that was the, the typing trickiness. Now we get to the design trickiness. Okay, so up until this point, we have a color and a matrix for every single particle we want to render, right? We could do that with textures, but it's probably gonna be inefficient. The reason for that is most likely multiple texture or multiple particles are gonna use the same texture. And so what we're going to do is instead of duplicating the values in a vector, we're going to have a vector which is only unique textures. We'll have a map which will take in the strings to textures. And if it already exists, we'll point back to the existing one. And then we're going to have another, it's not really a map, it's like an indirect array, uh, which is going to point to uh, each texture each particle is using. So we can send that to our shader, which is going to be that size of 100, and we'll point to where in our texture array we should be using. Uh, it's the same concept if you've done any database work, the same idea of instead of storing a value every single time uh, in a table, making a new table if you know that there's not, or there's gonna be a lot of repetition. Or even when you save images, uh, oftentimes there's like a palette. So we copy all of the duplicate colors. It's the same thing if you ever uh, torrented movies uh, back in the day and you would get those like, especially in dark scenes, you would get like these solid square blocks of the same color. They're trying to minimize the number of colors and they're trying to store all of those colors as one color so that they can use that. Okay, so we are going to have a vector textures. So this vector is going to hold the texture handles. Shouldn't have duplicates. Okay, so to go along with that, we're going to add a map, which I probably need to include. We'll call it the texture map. And this will map file paths to already loaded texture 
indexes. So this is where it gets a little confusing. I want to be clear. This unsigned int here is an index in here. It's not a handle. I could really set this as an int or a size t. Size t might not be a bad idea. This looks a little bit clearer. Okay. And we'll include a map. That looks good. Now we are going to have a vector of ints and we're going to call it instance order capital O to texture. So this vector's job take gl instance id and map to textures. So I'd make this an unsigned int or a size t, but for passing it to the shader, it's probably better to be an int. So this, we're gonna use that gl instance id and we're gonna access it and it's gonna return where in textures we should have our image we're looking for. Okay. Now, to go with this, we need to pass a image path in here. Um, my code right now is not very fail safe. It's insisting you have an image path. Uh, and if it fails, it fails. Uh, it would really be a good idea to say, have it support if you have an empty string, if there's nothing there, we just ignore and we keep moving forward. Do I have to include that too? Or even if we fail, maybe we fail gracefully and we uh, still draw the particle just without the texture. There we go. Okay, so all of this is going to be the same, but now we need a little bit of tricky code in here. So with that map, we want to see if we're loading a texture, do we already have that texture loaded? So a good way to do this in C++ is this count function. So if texture map dot count with the image path is greater than zero, that means we already have that texture loaded. And that means texture map at image path will return to us the index in M textures. So if that's the case, we can say instance order to texture and place back. So make a new spot in this vector and store in it texture map at image path. You can also use the hard brackets here. The nice thing with at is it's a, uh, you can have a variable be const and use at, whereas using the square brackets or the hard brackets, uh, it's no longer a const operation. So otherwise we need to load this texture. So we'll say unsigned int texture. We're gonna use our helper class, load texture, our image path. Looks like I need to include that as well. I think this one, because they're already in the same spot, we can just do that. Okay, so if texture does not equal negative one, textures dot in place back, let me give it that texture. So that has now stored the texture handle. Our texture map going to insert. So this is where a little bit of fancy modern C++ I'm using here. Okay, so I'm inserting into our texture map the path, that string, and I'm mapping it to the last spot in textures. Now using these curly braces. Um, this is similar a little bit to uh, the way I'm using in place back where those curly braces will automatically make a pair where I could also say, I think I can do STD make pair with that if I wanted to. 
but the curly braces just do the same thing. A little bit of fun C++ for you. Okay, and the final one, instance order to texture is actually gonna be the same line because it's now in our data structures. Cool. All right, so our create particle has been updated. That looks good. Now, the important part here, we need to update our shaders and we need to update our render. So why don't we start with the shaders, seeing as I forgot about it last time. Okay. So, first part, this is, this is why I was like, maybe we'll get to this, because there's a couple tricks we need here. So, we are going to need our instance order to texture. Actually, you know what? We can use that in our fragment shader. We don't need that here. Okay. What we are going to need, though, is some coordinates, some UV coordinates. Um, at this point, we have two outs. We should really group them together in a structure, but for the time being, I'm going to leave it. Okay, so this stuff is good, but we need to get some coordinates. Now, if you guys remember from the text rendering video, I like to, um, if we go back to what our starting point was here, our starting point had texture coordinates set in here. Um, I like to just set positions when I can get away with it and map them. So here, we're going to try and map 1, 1 to 1, 1, 1, minus 1 to 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1 to 0, 0, right? We're going to try and do that mapping. So it's actually not too bad. All you have to do, there's kind of two different ways you can do it, depending on how you want to do the math. You can divide this. So we're now going from minus one and one, which is a range of two, and adding it. To half and half. So if this is one, one, this is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And then we add to that 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it's one. If this is minus one, minus one, it's gonna be minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5, and we get zero, zero. Uh, you can do it this way, or you can add, then do the multiplication or division. Okay. Now, in here, we have a couple things we're going to add. We're going to add a uniform sampler to D textures. Okay, so you're going to want to be careful on your system when you do this. I'm saying 30 textures here. That's all going to depend on your system. You may go to run this code and it doesn't allow that many, in which case you'll just want to lower that number. I'm only going to use two in our test, so we really don't even need the 30, but. Okay, and then we'll have that direct mapping. And of course, two chords. All right. So this has gotten a fair amount more complicated. We're still gonna use that color, so we'll be able to tint our textures, but we're gonna say texture 2D at textures, and then the, ind the index we want is going to be instance order to texture at index. Now you'll remember in our vertex shader, we set the GL instance ID to index. So we're getting it here. We're saying this is the fifth particle I'm rendering. What texture should I be using for that? And we'll get that from there. And then we're going to say coords, which will give us the UV coordinates. And we'll tint the whole thing by color. One last thing I like to do, I'm not really sure if this is bad practice or not, but I like to, if the alpha is zero, discard it. Now, the reason for that is because we're doing our depth tests and we're writing to the depth buffer, if you have a fully transparent object right in front of the screen, right in front of everything, uh, it'll write to the depth buffer if we don't discard it and it'll occlude everything, but you won't actually see any changes. So that's why I do that discard there. Okay. Now, let's go back to our render. 
and see if we can whip this into shape. So first off, we're gonna have to call helper binds textures. We'll give it our shader ID and, oh, no, I gotta actually get the uniform location. There we go. I think we called it textures. Let's make sure we did. Okay. And we're going to give it M textures. Okay. So I'll make sure that our array of samplers is set. Actually, I'm going to do this after that. Okay. Our colors is good. Our matrices is good. Now we need to set up our instance order to texture. Uniform V for one on V. So we're going to have to get the location. Once again, a good optimization here would be it would be nice to store these locations so we aren't calling it every single time. It's kind of just a waste of time, right? But string. Now we are going to send size and we are going to do and one. Okay. So we have our textures and we have our instance order to texture. Nothing else there. That looks good. All right, so we're almost ready to test. We now just have to change our constructor a little bit because now it's expecting to have some textures passed in. So I'm gonna update this code a bit. I'm gonna say if i mod two is equal to zero, run this code, else, This. And I'm just going to give them different image paths. So if it's divisible, if it's an odd or an even number, we use different paths. So we get different files. And I went ahead and I just used paths from the Learn OpenGL. Uh, where are they? Resources, textures. So I use this awesome face and the window, where's the window in here? Up here, just so I could tell them apart. Some of these are weird files and may make you think that your code is not working properly, but it is. Uh, so just be careful with that. Um, the other thing I'll say is because we don't have that file system thing, we got to get the whole path. So I'm actually just going to All right, I'm going to switch the slashes so they're not escape characters. Textures slash awesome face PNG. And we'll do the same over here, except window. All right. Now I feel like we have written an awful lot of code. <laughs> Let's see how many mistakes we've made. Oh, we got errors. Doesn't like the vertex pose identifier undeclared. Okay. Ah. You know what the reason was? Because I think a pose is a terrible variable name. So I switched these. Okay. Let's see what happens now. Is there more still? Yep. Okay. 
from the fragment, one of our inputs is bad. Oh, missed a semicolon. Bam, there you go. That's all right, we had to pay the bug tax. You gotta have some bugs to make it work, right? Okay, so there's a lot going on here, right? We now have textures. We're still tinting. It looks like absolute chaos. Um, a lot of what's happening here is you can see like there are texture or there are particles within each other, but also because our scale uh, allows to be so small, I think I even have it down to zero. Yeah, let's up these. There we go, it's a little better. Uh, you get these like tiny little particles that could be far off. That's awesome. Okay, so today we successfully created our particle system class and we started moving our logic over there. Uh, we added in some textures. We used instanced rendering to improve our performance. We used textures and we had some fancy mapping to make sure that we don't waste on the textures that we pass along. And we really made some big progress into turning this into a particle system. Uh, the thing we're gonna start working on next is emitters. So we're gonna have some actual logic. We're gonna have some particles actually moving around, which is good. Uh, so we can actually see how this looks and I can stop having smiley faces and you guys will be blown away finally. So with that, we'll call it for today. Thanks so much for watching guys. I really, really appreciate it. It's been great seeing all the feedback and all the views. Keep it coming and I'll have this posted on GitHub like all of our projects. And until I see you for the next one with emitters, have a great day.